here are some really interesting features about, uh, about what you just saw, right? And what's interesting is this is classroom discourse, but it's also profoundly different in, in, in these nine ways. I'm sure there are more ways as well, but let me just list nine. Firstly, in the classical classroom where people put up their hand, uh, one student answers, maybe two, but there's no need to go much beyond that. Maybe two if the first answer is wrong. Um, but in this environment, every single person responds. Um, the second point is that there are lowered barriers to response. Now, I have a little theory about, uh, about classroom discourse normally is the person who puts up their hand and answers the question uh, is always the wrong person. The first person to, you know, the person who's keenest and most enthusiastic to answer, um, it's a certain type of person and it's that kind of person always. And um, there are certain kinds of person, people that habitually get left out of this unless the teacher goes around and picks them out and makes them answer, which is a horrible feeling, as you, as you know. Um, so um, what this does is this lowers the barriers to response. Uh, and in fact, more than that, you can actually insist that everyone responds. Everyone must give an answer. And because you can see other people's answers coming through, um, you get a little bit of confidence about what you might say. Um, and uh, th this way, um, uh, you know, but, but, but also there's a comment box down the bottom there. And when you get to the comment box, you've got a little while to think before you actually speak. You can, you can sort of, you, you know, there's, a, there's something which is intimidating about oral speech and the spontaneity of oral speech. So when you get to the bottom, you've got just a few seconds before you press the, um, uh, the, the comment button. Um, my third point is that this is a very interesting transition point from the oral to the written. So oral language is actually no sentences, it's just a pile of clauses, it's redundant, it's, it's, uh, there's lots of uh, repetition in it, there's lots of uh, hesitation, but this gives you a little bit of a chance, if it's two or three sentences and you've got a minute to think about it, to think about what you write, to turn it into sentences, to make it less redundant, to be a little bit more careful about what you write. In other words, it takes you closer to formal academic literacy in some interesting kinds of ways. But the fourth point is that when everybody's responding like this in writing, um, learner differences become interesting and visible and valuable. They become useful. So in fact, my Pluto question, like most questions in the world, there is an equivocal answer. Pluto is arguably not a planet and there are other things that perhaps are planets. Um, that all these things which seem to be inevitable and fixed and certain in the world. In fact, there are points where you can argue subtle differences and actually we can start a discussion there about whether it is or it's not in a way that it wasn't easily possible in the conventional hands-up routine. The fifth point is that this is really, really engaging. I mean, you know, there's a lot of comments coming through and so instead of hearing one comment, by the one person who puts up their hand, you're actually hearing, let's say it's a class of 20 or 30, you're hearing, getting 20 or 30 comments, and you've got to speed read it, and it's got the same kind of cognitive intensity um, that, uh, that social media has, which is you can't read every line that's coming through in social media, and nobody does. Uh, but we do sort of have methods for scanning it and getting the sense of what's important. Well, that's what you have to do in this environment and it involves an active scanning in a way that you know compared to speech speech is relatively slow um, your brain goes much faster than speech does uh, so to hear one person give an answer is actually not very engaging but to have 30 answers that you have to scan actively to make some sense of that's highly engaging and it's as engaging as social media is in fact i would argue that in the social media area when our learners are so used to these kinds of uh, cognitively very, very intense environments um, that, that, that they will be less tolerant of those traditional communicative means like um, you know, conversation and speech than they were in the past. But number six is the read-write mix in the participation is about write. So just think about um, that classroom. In the classroom when one student answers, most students are passive, they're just listening. So when I say read-write, I mean that metaphorically. Um, our listening is a form of, of reading. It's a form of, uh, you know, it's the less active of the, the modes. Um, it's pretty active, but it's, it's less active than, than writing and speaking are. So, uh, but what we have here is we have a, a mix of reading and writing. You're reading what other people are saying and you're writing. And what's interesting, if you compare social media compared to the newspaper, 
Newspaper was read only, social media is read write. So we built a textual environment which is a read write environment where the mix is about the same as social media and it's a good balance actually. But getting to number seven, and this is the point of this, this thesis, this first thesis, we can break out of the four walls, the classroom and the cells, the timetable. So this discussion can happen overnight, you know, go home kids and talk about this or, um, but it also can happen live. So we've got some very nice uh, examples from our research where the students are participating in a discussion like this in their classroom. They're kind of talking to each other as well, but one of the nice things is rather than one person talk while everybody listens or just talk to the person beside you, um, you're talking to the person way on the other side of the room, then the person beside you, then somebody here. And sometimes there's a bit of oral conversation which goes on top because you can talk to the person beside you. It's this layered event um, where um, there is no difference, and this is our thesis, there is no difference in this discursive form between being in the classroom in person and not being in person. There is no difference between face-to-face -face and online. And in fact, these kinds of architectures can support face-to-face -face learning using the same methods that they do for online learning. There is no difference between online and face-to-face. -face. Um, number eight is anyone can be an initiator. So, you know, um, either the initiation, which we call in Scholar an update, can be by the professor or the teacher, um, uh, and then everybody comments on that. Uh, and we call that an admin update because the role is admin and member. Um, or uh, anybody can create that post which begins a discussion. Go away and do some research and create some content which people then respond to. Uh, so you, around the class you might give a whole lot of different roles, a bit of content about Pluto, a bit of content about Mercury, a bit of Pluto, uh, content about uh, Uranus, if we're doing the solar system as a kind of trivial example. And we can do the solar system where each person becomes an expert on one of these topics and posts on it, and then other people react to their, their, their posts. So it actually, anyone can be an initiator, and we're kind of turning it around instead of the uh, textbook bringing content into the classroom, the students are bringing content into the classroom and disseminating it amongst each other. Um, and the last point, number nine, is this can create a new transparency. Remember that little kid that was looking up we didn't know why she was looking up. It might be good for good for good reasons. In fact, we conclude because she then turned around that it was probably not for good reasons. Maybe it was for good reasons. Maybe she wanted to talk about the topic, but she wasn't supposed to. Um, but anyhow, what it does is um, the new transparency is that we can say to everybody, you must respond. We can see how much they responded. And in fact, in this universe of learning analytics, we're increasingly able to see what it is they're saying, compare what they're saying in relation to other people and in relation to the original post. So we're, we're able to assess this, uh, these conversations in ways that we weren't in the past. Oral conversation was pretty ephemeral um, and, um, and, and that, that was something where you, know, you had a subjective sense that somebody was participating in class but actually it was usually the wrong, <laughs> the wrong people and there are a whole lot of people who you really need to be teaching who you weren't. So um, assessment was often skewed in the, in the wrong direction in terms of types of people. These ideas in general terms, and I'm just going to refer to these generally, um, we've been talking about the affordances of these new learning environments. Uh, these are seven affordances, multimodal learning, recursive feedback, collaborative intelligence, um, uh, metacognition, differentiated learning, ubiquitous learning, active knowledge making. And in fact, we have another series of videos and a MOOC called eLearning Ecologies where we uh, where we investigate these things in detail. So again, to summarize what we do with the first generation of uh, digital tools is we reproduce the logic of that old classroom as, a, as a, a, a knowledge architecture, as a communications architecture and its pedagogies, we reproduce them in digital environments. But our question that we're asking ourselves is how can we do something which is profoundly different? And if you want to read more about this, this book here um, is a summary um, of these ideas.